right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Everybody have their Bible? All right, amen. Paper? No paper, but you have uh, probably smartphones, tablets. I see somebody has a computer. Everybody's ready for their notes. All right. So what we're going to plan to do today is finish up uh, on Daniel chapter 2. We're walking through the uh, 1843 and 1850 charts point by point. And so we're covering things that many of us are very, very familiar with. Uh, but as we learn today, it's always good to go over even some of what we consider the simple things in order to deepen the impression. And uh, we might even see things that we, we had forgotten or never knew before. All right, so we, we left off with the second kingdom of Bible prophecy, which was Medo-Persia, and uh, we're going to get into the third. So before we begin, let us kneel for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, as we take the opportunity this afternoon to once again open the scriptures, we pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that the things that we learn on, on these afternoons, which we stay behind and study, will aid us and as well as encourage us and strengthen us when we go out on the different afternoons door to door and to share our faith. And so, Father, we pray that you will guide and keep us and grant us your Holy Spirit we learn, dear Father, that without the Holy Spirit, uh, we can uh, really do nothing. Uh, without you, we can do nothing. And through your Holy Spirit, you aid and guide and bless us. And so, Father, as we run to and fro in the Bible, we pray that the mighty teacher of truth would be our guide. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's go in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And uh, while you're turning to Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to pull up a, a statement we, we left off in reading last, last uh, study time together two weeks ago. We do our afternoon, afternoon Bible studies every other week. The first and the third Sabbaths. So we're in Daniel, the second chapter. And some of the things that we looked at when it comes to Daniel chapter 2, we've learned that how many times did Nebuchadnezzar have his dream? You remember? How many times? So I'm, I'm hearing some say twice, and some are kind of like, mm, I don't know how many times. Well, the Bible doesn't say how many, but we know it was at least twice, right? Because the Bible shows, go back to Daniel, the second chapter, and we'll start in verse 1. Just a quick review. Daniel chapter 2 <clears throat> and verse 1. The Bible says, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his, sleep break, excuse me, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams, plural, so they came and stood before the king. So in verse 1 and 2, it's very clear he had more than one dream, and he calls the men to tell him his dreams, right? Then it says in verse 3, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a what? A dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So the Bible shows that he had more than one dream, calls the magicians, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans to show him his dreams. And then when he brings them before him, he says, Listen, I have a dream that I want you to tell me. So the Bible identifies that he has a singular dream, but more than once. And there was a reason for that. And we we uh, learned about that this morning very briefly. The brother touched on the principle that you find in the book of Genesis, all right, chapter 41. Let's just go there quickly, Genesis chapter 41, keeping a finger in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, but in Genesis 41 and verse 32, in your hearing it says, for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So what the dream was in Daniel chapter 2, it was revolving the latter days. Uh, we see that very clear in the interpretation of the dream. And this dream regarding the latter days or the last days was so important that God gave it to the king more than once because it is established and God would shortly bring it to pass. Everything he saw in the dream, from the head of gold, which we saw was Babylon, to the breast and arms of silver, which we learned were Medo-Persia, 
all the way down to the feet and toes of iron and clay, God would bring these things to pass just as he established them in the dream that he gave to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there was something else that uh, we, we talked about this morning. If you go with me to the book of uh, Job, there was a scripture uh, that was used that I thought was very appropriate for this afternoon's lesson, Job 33. Job chapter 33. And I want you to look with me in Job 33 and verse 14. More than just a dream of the latter days, more than just trying to show us what was to come, we learned last time in our study as well that prophecy is uh, uh, salvific in nature. We learn that there is a moral purpose for prophecy, that God reveals his secrets to us so that we may do all the words of his law. And we learn that if we're doing his law, we're not breaking his law. And if we're not breaking his law, we're not what? What is the transgression of God's law? Sin. So if you're not breaking the law or transgressing and you're doing the law, what are you not doing? You're not sinning. So he reveals his secrets to keep us from sinning. Now, this particular dream, of course, was given to Nebuchadnezzar. It was revealed by Daniel, and it wasn't just written for Nebuchadnezzar. It was written for all of those who would come after him, including you and I. But God works on an individual level. When he deals with men, he deals with individuals. He doesn't save in groups. And so when he gave this dream to Nebuchadnezzar, it was for him personally to keep him from falling. Now, I'm going to show you something. Look at Job 33. Job 33, we're going to start in verse 14. When you're there with me, amen. Job 33 and verse 14. So God gave the dream to Pharaoh, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar. How many times? More than once. At least two, right? The Bible says, for God speaketh once, yea, how many times? Twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night. When deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his what? Purpose and hide what? Pride from man. Why did God give this dream to Nebuchadnezzar? What was the whole purpose of giving this to Nebuchadnezzar? Was it just to show him what was going to happen to Babylon? What do we know God was trying to do to Nebuchadnezzar? He was trying to humble him and save him. And he finally accomplished that, remember? Nebuchadnezzar is finally, finally uh, converted. But this is where God is trying to get Nebuchadnezzar, and he gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream. The Bible says that in a dream, in a vision by the night, when the deep sleep falleth upon men, and slumberings upon his bed, then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, and hide pride from man. This is exactly what God was doing for Nebuchadnezzar. He was seeking to win him to Christ. And so therefore, the dream of Daniel chapter 2 is more than just a skeleton of Bible prophecy. It's more than just letting you know A, B, C, you know, from uh, 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 677 all the way down to the end of time. It's giving you the steps of how God is going to save man. And this is what he's trying to do. And by God's grace, we're going to bring these principles out as we study Bible prophecy. So one of the things we learned as well, and I want to bring this particular statement up, and then we'll get back into our Bible. As we were walking down through the head of gold and the breast and arms of silver, we made mention to, or, or we, we asked a question, why was it that God is making a distinction between body parts from the head, to the chest and arms, to the belly, finally to the legs, then down to the feet and toes, why was he making this distinction, and why was he using different metals that are very valuable, and then they begin to lessen in value? What is the principle that God was trying to teach? You remember it? Well, let's listen to the statement, right? This is a youth instructor, youth's instructor, September 22, 1903. Youth's instructor, September 22, 1903. The image revealed to Nebuchadnezzar while representing the deterioration of kingdoms of, the, of earth in power and glory also fitly represents the deterioration of religion and morality among the people of these kingdoms. As nations forget God, in like proportion they became weak morally. Then skipping a bit it says, as they forgot him, they sank lower and still lower in the scale 
of moral worth. And so when we're talking about the head of what? What is the head made of? Is it the most expensive of the metals? Yes, it is. And the head also is what, you know, where, where you have your seat of reason, correct? Where you can choose the Lord, especially in our frontal lobe. And this was a fitting representation of Babylon. Though a heathen nation, though surrounded by idolatry, they were more moral and more religious than the times of the feet and toes, or even than the times of the chest and arms of silver. And so it, it shows a deterioration of morality and religion. The scale of moral worth is what we see in the feet, or excuse me, in the, the image of iron and clay. And so we'll just stop there. Let's go back in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 38, 38 together. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38. And our goal today would be to finish the, uh, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and uh, identify some things about the iron and clay, and then we'll pick up what the iron and clay specifically in our next Bible study two weeks from now. So Daniel chapter 2 and verse 38. The Bible says, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heavens, he hath given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And we learn that he was speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of what? Babylon. And even though the Bible says, Thou art this head of gold, we learn that when God is speaking to the king, he's referring to his kingdom. And you can even see that in the language of verse 39. For it says, and after thee shall arise another one. Kingdom, not another king, but another kingdom inferior to thee. So we've gone from the head of gold, which we learned was Babylon. So I'll just put HG. All right. Head of gold is Babylon. And then and went to the breasts and arms of silver. So we'll do uh, C-A-S, so chest and arms of silver. And we learned that that was Medo-Persia. We won't go over all the scriptures that brought us there. But we're finishing off verse 39. It says, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another what? Third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over how much of the earth? All of the earth. All right, so this, this third kingdom, which is the breast and arms of silver, you can see that in verse 32, this, this third kingdom of, uh, uh, excuse me, this uh, third kingdom of brass, excuse me, is the, the belly and the thighs of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now let's find out who this is. Let's find out who this is. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And one of the things that we have learned already is that when you're looking to find out who the head of gold is and the chest and arms of silver are, you don't really have to leave the book of Daniel. You can just go through the prophecies of Daniel. You can go from Daniel chapter 2 and connect that with Daniel you know, chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8 and then chapter 9 and 10 through 12. You can connect all the chapters of Daniel and the Bible actually gives you the names of these particular kingdoms. And that's because the book of Daniel is built upon a principle. And this principle is called repeat and enlarge. How many have ever heard of that principle before? Repeat and enlarge. In other words, God gives you a little bit in Daniel 2. But then when you come to the next vision in Daniel 7, he takes those same kingdoms, those same uh, powers and principles and builds upon them and gives you more. Then you come into chapter 8, it's the same dream, same vision, same kingdoms, but it's a different aspect of the vision, and he gives you more information, and he continues to do that. So he doesn't switch up the kingdoms on you. It always starts with Babylon. Are you with me? Always starts with Babylon. All right, so notice Daniel. Daniel chapter 8. Let's find out who comes after me to Persia. So we're in Daniel chapter 8. We're looking in verse 1 together. Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. And uh, do we have a microphone? Maybe we can run around. We can get some, uh, some volunteers. If the mic is not ready, I'll, I'll go ahead and read this one. 
but the next few scriptures will have some volunteers read. So Daniel chapter 8, and beginning with verse 1, we're trying to find out who comes after Medo-Persia. The Bible says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. It says, I, And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a one, a ram which had how many horns? Two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was what? Higher than the other. And the higher one came up when? Last. Now, those, those, those distinctive uh, phrases are very important, especially as we study Daniel 7. All right, so just uh, notice how the Bible reads, and we'll look at these things uh, further when we get into the next vision. But it says this ram with two horns comes, one horn was higher than the other, the higher of the horn comes up last. I saw the ram pushing where? Westward and what? Northward and what? Southward. Now if it's pushing westward and northward and southward, where is it coming from? It's coming from the east, so it's an eastern power. All right, so just keep these things in your mind. This will help us in our upcoming lessons. So that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that can deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, and what? And he goat came from the what? West on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, and he came to the ram that had the two horns, which I saw sta seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler or anger against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that can deliver the ram out of his hand. So what happens to the ram? It's destroyed. Who destroys the ram? The he-goat. Now let's find out who they represent. Look in chapter uh, 8, verse 20. Same chapter, verse 20. If we can get a, a volunteer to read verse 20 and 21 for us. Who is the ram with the two horns? And then finally, who overcomes the ram that represents this he-goat? Daniel chapter 8, verse 20. And the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. All right. So we've learned already in Daniel chapter 5 that we, well, we learned that Babylon is the first kingdom of prophecy. Who came and destroyed Babylon? Medo-Persia. Daniel chapter 5 tells that story. Then Medo-Persia becomes the kingdom of Bible prophecy, or it rears the crown now. So the crown has been passed to Babylon. Where did Babylon get the crown from? Let me ask this question. And I and I will we'll revisit this. But who was the first to wear the crown as the kingdom of Bible prophecy? This is, I want you to think about this for a moment. So then why is not Assyria the first kingdom of Bible prophecy? We talked about this two weeks ago. And I thought, I, I thought you would say Assyria, but it's not Assyria, it's Israel. Israel was the first to wear the crown of Bible prophecy. And we'll, I'll bring a statement to you where I believe it's in the book Education where she talks about how the crown passed from Israel to Babylon, from Babylon to uh, Medo-Persia, from Medo-Persia to Greece, and so on and so forth, until, it, until it's given to him whose right it is, which is speaking of Christ. So the first kingdom of prophecy, the first kingdom or nation identified in prophecy is really Israel. But then when they go into captivity in Babylon, the crown passes from them onto Babylon's head. Not that Babylon came to being in 677, but that's when they got the crown from Judah, from the people of God. All right. Then that crown passed to Medo-Persia, when Medo-Persia destroys Babylon. So then now it's going from Medo-Persia, who is the ram, to the he-goat. And who's the he-goat according to Bible prophecy? Grecia or Greece. All right, so Greece is the next kingdom 
of Bible prophecy. And it begins where Medo-Persia leaves off. And in our story of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, this is the belly and thighs of brass. So BTB, belly and thighs of brass. Head of gold, Babylon. Chest and arm of silver, Medo-Persia. Belly and thighs of brass, Greece. All right, the Bible gives you the very name right there. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Very simple study on Daniel chapter 2. There's a lot of things here that we'll come back and touch on and build upon, but we want to keep it very simple to get a nice foundation for our study of the, the charts. All right, so Daniel chapter 2, we left off in verse 39. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 39. So let's begin... I tell you what, let's back, back up now and look at verse 33. Let's just back up and read verse 33. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 33, his legs of iron, his feet, part of iron and part of clay. All right, so now let's look at verse 40. If we can get a, a volunteer to read verse 40. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. All right. Now, something that's very interesting about the vision of Daniel. Whereas Daniel mentions Babylon by name and Medo-Persia by name and Greece by name, it doesn't mention the fourth kingdom by name. Instead, it gives you characteristics. All right. It's very important because in all the vision, it doesn't mention it by name. You can't go to a prophecy and it says this particular name. It doesn't do that. It just gives you characteristics of this kingdom. And as you trace these characteristics through the Bible, it can be only one power. And why do you think the Bible does this? Let me ask the question. Why does God uh, take time to quickly mention Babylon, to quickly mention Medo-Persia, and quickly mention Greece, but when it comes to the fourth kingdom, it doesn't do so. It gives you an abundance of characteristics. Why would God do that? Why do you think? Why do you think? Anybody? Just, just a, a wild guess, right? Because we're studying, it, we're talking. Because it comes in two phases? All right, well, that's because I think you already know who it is, right? You're, you're, you're jumping ahead, but why would God do that? Why would he mention a few and give you only clues about the other? What do you do with clues? You have to search, right? If I'm giving you an abundance of clues, do I want you to focus on Babylon? No, I gave you the name. Do I want you to focus on Medo-Persia? No, I gave you the name. Do I want you to focus on Greece? Nope, I gave you the name. But I'm giving you all these clues. I'm not going to tell you who it is. So if you want to find out who it is, what do you have to do? I have to search. And then therefore, this is placing the fourth kingdom in great distinction from all the rest. This particular kingdom now becomes the focus of these prophecies. Are you with me? All right, it's very important. This particular kingdom, we'll see, establishes the vision of Bible prophecy. All right, Daniel 11, verse 14. This kingdom establishes the vision. Babylon doesn't. Medo-Persia doesn't. Greece doesn't. But the fourth kingdom establishes the vision. And we're going to elaborate on that in upcoming lessons, what that means. But let's look at some of the characteristics of this fourth kingdom. It says the fourth kingdom shall be what? Strong as iron. We're in verse 40. It shall be strong as iron. For as iron, what does iron do? Breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that what? Breaketh all these, shall it what? Break in pieces and what? Bruise. Okay. So this particular kingdom, the first characteristics of this power is that it breaks and bruises. What does this kingdom do? Breaks and bruises. Now remember, we're studying Bible prophecy. And all of Bible prophecy, every prophecy, there is a connection. It is one grand story. All right, this is one grand story. The principle of repeat and enlarge you see all throughout the book of Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel but it's Bible prophecy in a nutshell is one grand story. So it's very interesting now where the very first prophecy in all of the Bible is about some power being bruised. Go with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. 
Go with me there. Genesis chapter 3. Where are we going? Genesis chapter 3. The characteristics of this power, and we know it's a kingdom, we know it's an empire, we know it's a nation. We know it's a, and a power like Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece. It, there's geography involved. But whoever this power, this kingdom, this nation is, the first characteristics of this power is that it breaks and bruises. And as a student of prophecy, that should cause your, your biblical antenna to go up because you're saying, wait a minute. The very first prophecy I read about is there will be a power that would bruise. All right, so look with me in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Let's, let's see if we can follow some clues. All right, so Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Are we all there? All right, can we get a, a volunteer to read Genesis 3 and verse 15? Genesis 3, verse 15. If you'd like to read, raise your hand. All right, just in the back. Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, so let's pause for a minute. Who's talking here? In Genesis 3, 15, who's talking? Who is he talking to? So it's a twofold question. Who's talking? Who's saying, I will put enmity between thee and the woman? The Lord is talking to the The Lord serpent. is talking, right? And he's talking to who? The serpent. And who is the serpent? It's a, it's a medium that Satan is using, right? So this isn't really for the snake. This isn't really for the serpent. He's really speaking to Satan. And he says, I will put enmity, warfare, hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It, speaking of the seed of the woman, will bruise your head. Now think about, think about, you know, the term bruising is not just, you know, a little punch and some capillaries break. This is referring to, to like a wound, a, a mortal wound. So what happens if I, if I crush the snake's head? What's going to happen to it? I'm going to kill it. So he says, it, the seed of the woman, is going to bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel, okay, sowing that uh, you, he, he'll be wounded, but it wouldn't be a, 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 a wound that would be uh, death forever. Let's put it this way, okay? And we know that Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, who is this a prophecy about? It's a prophecy about Christ, how Christ would come, how Christ would be wounded. He would receive his, his wound in his heel. And did he receive a wound in his heel literally? Yeah. All right, he was, he was pierced, right, through his feet, okay? Uh, but did he rise from the grave? Yes, he did. So he, he wasn't mortally wounded to the point of no return. But the promise is that he would one day crush the serpent's head. And when he destroys the devil, will he, will he arise a second time? No, affliction shall not rise a second time, we're told in the book of Nahum. So this is the ultimate prophecy, that there was sin, now there's a savior, the devil would uh, do his work to bruise him, but then one day the devil himself would be bruised, right? Wonderful prophecy. All right, but it talks about this bruising. All right, we're talking about Daniel 2 now, right? Daniel 2, verse 40. This power is going to break and bruise. The first time in the Bible, when it comes to Bible prophecy, bruising is mentioned, is the bruising of who? Christ. I want you to remember that. Okay, the bruising of Christ. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it doesn't say Jesus. Uh, it simply says, the seed of the woman. And Bible prophecy elaborates on this story as well. If you go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Go there with me. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation, where are we going? Chapter 12. And I want you to look with me in verse 1. Now, Revelation chapter 12 is a very powerful prophecy with numerous layers we're just going to look at one layer specifically as it relates to the bruising of the seed of the woman. Okay? So who is the seed of the woman? Who is the seed Genesis 3.15 is talking about? We already know, but let's, let's give some, uh, some other Bible text. So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 through 5. Revelation 12, 1 through 5. Is there anyone that would like to read that for us? Revelation chapter 12. Raise your hand. Revelation 12, 1 through five. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, 
and the moon under her feet, and under her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man-child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her children was caught up and her children was caught up up unto God and to his throne. All right, her child, singular. Did I say child? Children. Children. That's that's all right. That's all right. So what I want you to notice here, there's this story, right? This is all symbolism. It's all symbolic. But we know that there's this woman, and is this woman, does she it says she was she was travailing in birth pain to be delivered. What does this mean? She's with child, right? She's about to give birth, all right? She, she, she has a seed within her. Now, when this child is born, the Bible says that this great red dragon, and who is this great red dragon on a, on a surface level? Who is the great red dragon? How do we know that? How do we know it's the devil? Verse 9. Let's look at verse 9, right? The Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and... Satan. So we know the dragon, the devil, uh, uh, is the devil rather. We know that this is Satan. And Satan, what is Satan trying to do to the seed of this woman? He's trying to kill it. Now who is this seed? The Bible says that this, this man child was born and was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and he was caught up to God and to his throne. Who does this symbolize? Symbolize Christ on one level. On one level. It's much deeper than that. We'll get into that later. All right, but the seed of the woman is Christ. Amen? And we know the seed of the woman, according to the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3.15, was going to be bruised. Right? Who was trying to do the bruising? According to Revelation 12. Satan. Now, does Satan operate in a, uh, does he operate behind the scenes and work through mediums? Or does he come out in front and do it himself? All the way from the beginning, his MO, his modus operandi, has been to work through a medium. He worked through the serpent. Now he's working through this great red dragon that has seven heads and ten horns. All right? In a secondary sense, this is a symbol of the power we're looking at that comes after Greece. All right, let's find out who was it that tried to destroy Christ as soon as he was born. We know the story, though. Who was it that tried to kill the child as soon as he was born? Herod. Okay, let's go with me to uh, uh, Acts chapter 4. Go with me to Acts, the fourth chapter. Acts chapter 4. And um, let's start in verse... Let's start in verse 25. Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 25. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4... And verse 25, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy what? Child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both who? Herod and who? Pontius Pilate with who? The Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand of thy counsel determined before to be done. So the Bible shows that who stood up against Christ? The holy child Jesus. Who stood up against him? Herod. Who else? Pilate. Who else? The Gentiles and who? The people of Israel. Now the people of Israel... Uh, we know who they are. These are God's people who were going against the Lord. He came to his own and his own received him not. But who is Herod? Who is Pontius Pilate? And who are the Gentiles in Bible prophecy? Who was the power that Herod worked under? Who was the power that Pontius Pilate worked under? This is Rome. In the Bible, in the book of, in the book of uh, 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 Acts even, Acts chapter 2, 
and so on. Uh, Rome is referred to as Gentiles and strangers. All right, so we know that Pontius Pilate, we know that Herod worked under Rome. The Gentiles are a symbol of Rome itself. So Rome is the power that's coming against the holy child Jesus. And who was the holy child Jesus according to Revelation chapter 2? Excuse me, 12. He was the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman according to Genesis 3.15, the prophecy was that this seed would be what? Bruised. And who was going to do the bruising? Who came against the holy seed? Who came against this holy child Jesus? Rome. Rome. Rome is the power that brings the bruising to Christ. And I want you to notice here, verse 28. It says that these individuals came against Christ. They gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. What was determined to be done upon Christ? What was the counsel of the Lord against or upon his son? It's a wonderful chapter that my brother said this morning. He reads every day. So let's go there to Isaiah 53. What was the counsel of the Lord against his son? And remember, we're talking about bruising. What is this counsel? Look at Isaiah with me, Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And we all have our Bibles. It's all before us. I say, let's just read it together. Let's just read through the chapter together. They'll hear me on the internet, but you can still read out loud, starting with verse 1. And we'll just read through slowly together. And I want you to see if anything pop out, pops out at you. So Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. Is everybody there? The Bible says this, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he hath done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What was the counsel of the Lord upon his son? That he would be stricken, or broken, and bruised. This was the counsel of Genesis 3.15. This was the very first prophecy about the seed of the woman, that would be stricken, that would be bruised, that would be smitten. The last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 12, goes further into this prophecy, showing who was going to be the one trying to bruise him. And who was it? It was the great red dragon. Yes, that's Satan. But Satan doesn't do it on his own. He works through mediums. And who was the medium that he worked through? Herod. 
and Pilate and the Gentiles. That's a symbol of Rome. All right, so Rome is the power. Here's the, the characteristics. Go back now to uh, Daniel 2. Go back now with me to Daniel chapter 2. Again, looking at these characteristics of the kingdom. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. The characteristic of the fourth kingdom uh, is that it is the kingdom that would bruise. All right, so this is the legs of iron. So L-R, or L-I rather, legs of iron. This is Rome. And the Bible does mention Rome by name. It does mention Rome by name. As a matter of fact, go with me to uh, Luke chapter 2. It just doesn't mention it in the prophecies of Daniel, uh, like it mentions uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. But go with me in your Bible to uh, Luke, the second chapter. Luke chapter 2. And let's, uh, let's identify very clearly that Rome was a kingdom uh, of, of biblical proportions, ruled the entire world. All right, so let's see this in the scriptures. Luke chapter 2, and uh, let's start in verse 1. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, if somebody would read that for us. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Okay, now let's think about something for a minute. How powerful do you have to be to send out a decree, a law, and say that all the world is going to come and pay you taxes? Think about that now for a minute. All right? All the world is going to pay me taxes. Do I have to be a world ruler? All right, I couldn't just, you know, I can't just, you know, get online or tweet it or, you know, put it out there on, 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 on Google and say, hey, you know, pay Jamal Sankey taxes. You might find one or two people that would do it, though. Some people say, hey, you got crazy people in the world, right? But everyone had to come and do it. Now, I don't have that kind of power because I'm not a world ruler. All right, there's, you know, the, the closest country on this planet right now that can make a decree of that proportion is this country. But yet there would be countries that would stand against it. I'm not paying you anything. But this power, this nation, said, listen, everybody, you come and pay tax. You had to do it. And that was because this power ruled the world. Now, who was this? Who, who was this nation? The Bible says it was a decree from who? Caesar Augustus. Who were the Caesars under? Was it Babylon? What about Medo-Persia? Greece. Who was the Caesars? Rome. All right. And then notice, notice what your Bible says in, in uh, John. Uh, John, it mentions Rome by name. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. All right, John chapter 11. Notice what your Bible says. Let's start in verse 45. John chapter 11 and verse 45. The Bible says in John 11, verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a, a, a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and who? The Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So they, re they realized that Rome was the power and authority over them. And if they rocked the boat too much, allowing Jesus to do what he would do, Rome would come and sweep them away. You see, at this particular point in time, though they were under the, the feet of Rome, there was relative peace. Rome still uh, uh, beautified their temple. Rome still allowed them to have their worship and, 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 and their priests and all their, their different uh, systems, but yet Rome was the ruling nation. And so at this particular point in time, who's the power that's ruling the world? Rome. And who, who came alive? Who was born during this particular point in time? Jesus. And the prophecy was that Jesus, the holy child, would, would be bruised, Right? 
he would be bruised, and therefore, who would have to be the one to do that word? Rome. If he was under the time of Greece, Greece would have done it. But this is the time where Rome is in power. All right, so here we have, uh, 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 here we have Rome coming into to power. And I'll put 158. I'm using the, the dates there that you have on the charts. And we'll talk about these dates a little bit further uh, along in our studies together. But I want you to go back with me to the book of Daniel. Let's just finish off the main skeleton of prophecy. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. Do I need a... Yeah, and that's why I said we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that because you're seeing, all right, from 677 to 538, then from 538 to 332, from 332 to 168, and then you're saying 158. Why is there a gap? We'll talk about that. We'll get into that. All right, let's just put the skeleton together, and then we'll put the sinew and the, and the muscles and the organs and the skin, and we'll do all of that and build a nice, beautiful picture. All right, but let's go to Daniel, the second chapter. Daniel chapter 2, and uh, let's start in verse 41. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. We left off in verse 40. So if somebody would read for us verse 41. We'll look at this verse, maybe five other scriptures after this, make some application, and then bring this to a close, and we'll pick up upon this in our next lesson two weeks from now. So Daniel chapter 2, and let's look together in verse 41. If somebody would read that for us. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the king shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. All right, so I want you to notice just something quickly here. All right, I want you to notice something. The Bible shows that this kingdom uh, in verse 41 it is a kingdom that is symbolized by the feet and the toes. Is that correct? So it's the feet and the toes. We know the legs of iron, L-I, the legs of iron is Rome. Uh, but we're getting into the feet and the toes. And um, let me just, before I forget, uh, just put this here. Just put this here. Um, The feet and the toes are iron and clay. Now, is there, is, there a, is, there a, is there anything in this particular verse, let me ask it this way, is there anything in this particular verse that uh, stand, stands out at you? Is there a transition or a change that you see in verse 41? I want you to read it closely. Take time to read it and then see if you can identify something that changes or that is described a different way. All right, so the elder says, you read first, it's potter's clay, and then you read that it transforms to miry clay. All right, so there is a change that takes place during this time period in this kingdom. All right, so we're going to identify what this clay represents uh, quickly here. Go with me in your, oh, I'll tell you what, start with Revelation. Go with me to Revelation. It's made of iron and clay. So let's start with the iron. We've already read a verse in Revelation chapter 12, but go with me to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2, and uh, let's read verse 26 and 27. Revelation chapter 2, 26 and 27. First, let's identify what iron represents. All right, so this is the feet and toes of iron and clay. So F-T-I-C, feet and toes, iron and clay. Who is this? Big question mark, okay? So let's, let's look at what iron represents and let's look at what clay represents, all right? So first in your Bible, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. If we can get a volunteer to read. Anybody have there? Uh, right there in the back, Sister, Sister Hall. Okay. 
And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. All right, so what I want you to notice here is the, po the promise is that uh, uh, if you're an overcomer, it says, and you keep God's words to the end, he will give you what over the, over the what? You're going to get what over the what? You're going to get power over the nations. What does it mean you'll get power over the nations? What does that mean? You're going to rule. All right. You can see that in verse 27. It says, and he shall rule them. Who is the them? The nations. And your ruling, your power is going to be symbolized by what? It says, he shall rule them with a what? Rod of gold. Iron. Silver. Iron. Brass. Iron. So iron is a symbol or connected with ruling the nations. All right. It's a symbol of statecraft or state power. All right. Power over the state. Let me give you another verse. Um, well, we'll just stick to Revelation since we're already there. Go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 15. There's quite a few verses that talk about ruling the nations with a rod of iron. Remember we read in Revelation chapter 12 that Jesus Christ himself, the seed of the woman, he was caught up to God and to his throne, and it says that he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. All right, so ruling the nations is always symbolized by, by the, or connected with the metal of iron. All right, so look at Revelation 19, verse 15. Revelation 19, verse 15. If we need another, another uh, reader for that verse. Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of the mouth, excuse me, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of, of Almighty God. All right, so again, ruling the nations is by this rod of what? Iron. All right, so iron, I'll just write it here. Iron is statecraft. Okay, now we have to find out what clay is. All right, go with me to Isaiah. Go in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah and verse uh, 64. Isaiah 64. Let's find out what the Bible says. Isaiah 64, and we're going to look together in verse 8. And after this verse, we'll look at another verse. Then I want to tie some things together and give you some homework, some things to think about, right? So Isaiah 64 and verse 8. I know many of us here, these are all, this is just review for many of us here, but you might have those online who are learning these things maybe for the first time. So Isaiah 64, and we're going to look at verse 8 together. What does clay represent? What is clay a symbol of? It states, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art the potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. All right, so here's God's people. Now, what is another name for the people of God? What do we call God's people? His church. church. So here are God's people, and they're saying, we are the what? Clay. And you are the potter. And we are the works of your hands. All right, so here you have the church people saying that they're the clay. But let's, let me give you another verse in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah uh, 18, Jeremiah chapter 18, and here's a, here's a uh, wonderful story or allegory about the potter's house, all right? So let's look at uh, Jeremiah 18, verse 1 through 6, and this will be our, this will be our last scripture that I'll have you read. So if, if we can get one more volunteer, last final volunteer to read Jeremiah, right here up in the front, Sister uh, Ventura. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. And we're talking about who the potter, or excuse me, who the clay represents in the potter's house, the potter being the Lord. Chapter 18, 1. The word which came to the Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, 
And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessels that he made of clay was marred in that hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? said the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. All right, amen. So house of Israel, the people of God, God's church, and in Jeremiah and in Isaiah, they are called the what? Or they are represented as clay, okay? So clay is a symbol of church craft. All right, so iron and clay. Now in Daniel chapter 2, you go back there. Go back there to Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we have this great vision, all right? And in this vision, its head was made of what metal? Gold. And that head of gold represented what? Babylon. Then there was the chest and arms of silver, and that was represented by Medo Persia. Then you had the belly and thighs of brass that represented Greece, and then you have the legs of what? Iron. iron, and that represented Rome. Now, iron also represents what? Statecraft. Statecraft. Now, in this final power, all right, or in the final aspect of the image, I'll say it this way, in the final aspect of the image, not do you just have iron, which is statecraft, but now you have iron mixed with what? Clay. It is a mixture of iron and clay. And clay represents what? Churchcraft. So if I have iron representing statecraft and clay representing churchcraft and I mix them together, what am I bringing together? Church and state. So whatever the feet and toes are, they are a combination of church and state. Now, let's, I, I'm going to say some things. Don't blurt anything out. I just want you to think. Okay? Let's pretend this is the first time you've ever heard these things. We've already learned that iron is the, the metal that symbolizes Rome. So is Rome still around in the feet and toes of the image? Because the iron is there. But Rome is now mixed with what? With clay, which is a church. So it's still the power of Rome, but it's now mixed with a church. Are you with me? In the legs, the church is not mentioned. It's simply the, the, the civil power. It's simply the empire of Rome. But now at the end, before the image is done and before the stone smites the image, there is this mixture of iron and clay. So it's Rome mixed with a church. Now, is this church a clean church? Is this church a clean church? I expected, you know, maybe some form of a, some sound or something to come out from the congregation. Oh, well, you're pretending. Well, no, you can still, you can pretend this is the first time you've heard it, but you read the Bible, right? So what does the Bible call the clay? It says it's what? Miry clay. And we're going to talk about what miry means, but you might already understand that miry means dirty, mucky, muddy, filthy. So whatever this church is that's mingled with Rome, it's a filthy church. But does the Bible identify that it started that way? The Bible shows the clay started as potter's clay and ended up as miry clay. Now what do you think this is showing? It's a transition that takes place. And what do we call this transition? Is it a good transition? No. No, it was a decline, right? It went from clean to bad. So in the language of Paul, let me show you what he calls it. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians. Go there with me. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians. And we can read about this through the writings of Paul. You can read about this through the seven churches. Um, it's all describing the same thing. We'll look at these, these verses together just briefly. But go with me to 2 Thessalonians. Look with me in chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 1. We read these verses a few weeks back when we were talking about the, the son of perdition. All right. Notice what your Bible says. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to start together in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a what? Falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now let's think about this, all right? Christ is not going to come except there come a what first? A falling away. Is falling away digression? Is it going down, or are you, are you progressing? You're going down. You may have started off good, but now you're falling away. And in the original language, this is the word apostasia, where we get the, the term apostasy. So when someone apostatizes, when someone goes into apostasy, they had to have been in the truth, but then they fall away. Now, is this talking about a state power, or is this talking about a church power? Well, let's see how we can show that. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. From that verse, you don't know if he's talking about church or state. But then he begins to describe, and you can see clearly that this is a power that is a church power. Because it says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called what? God or that is worshipped, so that he as who? God sitteth where? In the temple of who? God showing himself that he is what? God. This is a church power that has fallen away. Are you with me? This is a church power that has fallen away. Let's look at another clue. Go with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Look with me in chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Now, for, for brevity's sake, make this very, very short and sweet. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you have the seven churches. And the first church starts in Ephesus. This is the time of the apostles. And I'll show you this. All right, so Revelation chapter 2. It's very easy to see that this is, even though it's symbolic here, you can see that it's referring to the time of the apostles. And how can you show this? Look at what the words of the Bible say. Revelation 2 verse 1. Are we all there together? Amen. Unto the angel of the what? Church of Ephesus. So are we talking about a church power or state power? Church power. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are who? Apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. All right, so here, during this time period of the church of Ephesus, this time period is the time period where it was, it was, you know, in vogue to be an apostle. People called themselves apostles, but they weren't. They lied. Now, you don't call yourself an apostle if you're not in the time of the apostolic church. So Ephesus begins with the church of the apostles. So think of some of the apostles. You don't have to birth them out, but just think of some of them. What kingdom or what civil power, what nation is ruling during this time? Who was around during the time of, say, the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter? Huh? Rome. You can go down the list, James and John, and it's Rome and Rome and Rome and Rome only. All right, so this church now, notice here, this church of Ephesus, which was a church symbolized by the white horse, the time of this first seal, a church going forth conquering and to conquer, a church that is given great accolades by the Lord. All right, God, God commends this church for her great work. This is the church when it was in its pure state. But this church was under the time of who? Rome. All right, this is the time of the apostles. Then you get into the time of the next church. All right, and this, this next church is the church of Smyrna. And during this time period, the church was still pure. And God made it so because he allowed persecution to break forth upon her. All right, so this church of Smyrna, uh, uh, she, she's greatly persecuted. It says in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of who? Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And so here you have the church it's pure. Ephesus time period under Rome, 
the church is pure. Then it comes to Smyrna, the church is still pure, but she's being persecuted. Now the devil learns, friends. He, you know, we're told in great controversy that the devil is converted after the modern order of things. He watches how things work. And if persecution is making the church better, instead of persecuting her, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I'm not going to persecute her. If I can't beat her, I'm going to join her. So I'm just going to flood the church with ungodly men. So hence, Pergamos, the church of Pergamos. It says in verse 12, And unto, unto the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things say it's he which hath the sharp two sword, uh, excuse me, hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even the days wherein Antipas was my faithful what? Martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, how many of us have ever read like Fox Book of Martyrs? All right. Uh, or bits and pieces of it. Right? I haven't gone through all of it. You know, Fox Book of Martyrs, you can only read so much. At least me. You know, you go through too many stories and it's like, ah, I'm good. Too many, too many, too many wicked stories of martyrdom. Now, who is Fox Book of Martyrs at that time period? What is, it, what is it all about, really? Persecution of who? The Christian church. Under what power? Oh. So here we're still under Rome because now Antipas is the faithful martyr. Now, it's very interesting what our pioneers understood about Antipas. You know, there's no historical reference for an individual called Antipas. But Antipas was actually a combination of two names or two words. Anti, all right, or, or you know, Antipas was, it was a combination of two words meaning against the Father. Now, God is commending this individual for being his faithful martyr or against Papa. All right, so this is, this is during the time period of Rome. Persecution is taking place. All right, now this is, this is you know, the Roman church. Bishops are around. Of course, this is not yet the great time of what we know the Roman church under Catholicism to be, but right before her, when the mystery of iniquity was already working, as Paul said, all right, during this time period, the church is becoming corrupt. Yet God's people, some uh, 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 went against the, uh, the, the, the norm of the day, and therefore they were martyred. And what happens? Notice what happens in verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there them that hold the doctrine of who? Balaam. Who was Balaam? Who was Balaam? Speak up now. Who's Balaam? Not Baal. Who's Balaam? I heard you say something. Who's Balaam? Not what Balaam represents. Who is Balaam? Like if, if somebody was to tell you who's Balaam in the Bible. Not the symbol of Balaam, but who was Balaam? He was a prophet, right? Or at least he, he was a prophet of God at one point, but he was a false prophet. He had fallen away because of filthy lucre's sake. All right, he served mammon rather than the Lord. Now Balaam, who was a prophet, it says, Thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Who was Balak? He was the king. All right, so king. Does the king represent iron or clay? Iron, statecraft. Who was Balaam the prophet then? Clay, churchcraft, right? And here you have Balaam teaching Balak. Or you see now church and what? State coming together. The church has started pure. Ephesus, Smyrna. But in the time of Pergamos, there's a what's taking place? A falling away. And that falling away is taking place. This great apostasy is taking place. And that apostasy takes place when you see two things coming together. Church and state. Okay? The church being potter's clay. But it, when it mingles with the state, it becomes miry clay. Does a church mingling with the state benefit the church at all? Does it benefit the church? No, it makes her filthy, according to Daniel chapter 2. When a church mingles with the state, when there is church-state interaction, the church never wins, friends. It always causes the church to fall away. It always causes compromise. It always causes apostasy. So when you see church and state coming together, it's not going to benefit the church. 
no matter how many laws are made religiously, it won't benefit the church at all. The church becomes corrupt. Okay, it becomes the cage of every foul spirit and every unclean and hateful bird. All right, this is what happens to the church. All right, notice what the Bible goes on to say. It goes on to say in verse 15, it says, Thou hast them there that hold, excuse me, thou hast, thou hast, also, thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Now, during the time of uh, the church of uh, Ephesus, uh, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And the Nicolaitans were, you know, in a nutshell, they were, let's just say it this way, they believed that you, 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 you couldn't overcome sin, that the law of God cannot be kept, that you'd just be sinning until Jesus come. All right, let's just nutshell that, right? This, is, this was their belief. The church of Ephesus hated those, those views, but now here in the church of Pergamos, they had those that held those doctrines. The church had now begun to adopt that view. You see the falling away religiously. And then it comes to the time of Thyatira. And then when you get into the time of Thyatira, the Bible says in verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman who? Jezebel. Now let me ask you a question. And I might be getting ahead of myself. Uh, but I, since I'm here, I'll say it anyway. Why does the Bible have to emphasize this? Why does it ha say thou hast them, or excuse me, it says thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel. Why did the Bible have to say that? Why couldn't it just say thou sufferest Jezebel? Why does it have to emphasize thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel? Huh? Okay, it's emphasizing something, wanting you to understand that this is a what? Woman, but not just a woman. Jezebel would take care of that, but this, this symbol of a woman, because this is a vision, that Jezebel is a symbol of a woman, and a woman represents a what? Church. Now, you know these things. We're getting ahead of ourselves. So now it says, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Now is Jezebel, was she a chaste virgin? Would you say that she would, if you were to compare her to clay, would she be potter's clay or miry? Very much so, right? Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, who, who's, who's, who was uh, Jezebel in the real story in the time period of Elijah? The wife of who? Ahab. Now, Ahab, you know, in this particular story, when you, when you see certain characters, by the way, when you see certain things, if, it just, if it's just talking about Jezebel, the story of Jezebel is never in a box in the Bible. When you see Jezebel, you're going to see Ahab. Here you have a woman married to this king who she shouldn't have been married with, a symbol how Jezebel symbolizing this church shouldn't be married to the what? To the state. But you don't see Ahab mentioned there, but we know he's there. And then if you have Jezebel and Ahab, who else do you have? You have Elijah. And Elijah represents those who had, them and those who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And you can read in the story here that there were those who had not gone and accepted her doctrine. So, all right, so uh, uh, wonderful things here. But what I want you to see is this. From the time period of Ephesus was, was the church under Rome. It had started off as potter's clay. But once it mingled with the iron, it becomes what? Miry clay. The, clay, the iron starts in the time period of Rome. So this iron, this statecraft is the time of Rome. It's the Roman power mingled with a church. Now, we don't know what church it is just yet, but it's mingled with a church. This church is not pure. This church could never be pure because it was connected with the state. And any time church and state come together, the church is no longer under the power of God. So this church, whoever this church represents, it was never it was never represented as God's people. It represents a church, state or churchcraft, rather, but it's miry clay. And the Bible emphasizes that. I want you to go there back to Daniel chapter 2. It does mention potter's clay. And the reason it mentions potter's clay is because it wants us to understand what's taking place. There is a falling away that is taking place during the time of Rome. The church becomes corrupted. All right, now what church is this, and we'll get into this in two weeks from now because we're gonna do a bit of a Bible study on what mire represents and how we can identify the characteristics 
of this power. But the fourth kingdom is Rome. Rome is still in the feet and toes of iron and clay. Rome is still going to be the, 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 the state power behind things. However, this clay, this church that is mingled with Rome, that is interwoven with Rome, is what's now being identified. It says in verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with what? Miry clay. The Bible says, and as the, feet and, the to uh, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with what type of clay? Uh, miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so what type of clay does the Bible emphasize? Miry clay. This is a filthy, dirty, corrupted church system that is mingled with the state. And this filthy, corrupted church system that is mingled with the state will bring us all the way down to the toes of the feet. This filthy, dirty, corrupted church system will be around till the end of time. All right, and we're going to look, in that, look at this a little bit further next time. But this great falling away that's being emphasized from potter's clay to miry clay takes place during the time of Rome, from the church of Ephesus, and it's falling away from, you know, Ephesus, Smyrna, then the compromise in Pergamos, and the great falling away into Thyatira. This is what's being identified during this time period. The book of Revelation really, the book of Revelation uh, really takes off and emphasizes this time period from Rome to the end. All right, that's the main focus of the book of Revelation and the uh, portions of the prophecy of Daniel. This is what Daniel really emphasizes. Remember, when you're reading in the book of Bible, uh, uh, books of Bible prophecy, Daniel and the Revelation, uh, you know, specifically Daniel, Babylon is mentioned, Medo-Persia is mentioned, Greece is mentioned, but we saw Rome is not mentioned in the prophecies of Daniel. Instead, he starts giving you breadcrumbs. The Bible shows that God just start throwing out little bits and pieces, wanting you to follow the trail, to do research. And what he's showing you is, I'm giving you the answers to these clues. This is not what I want you to focus on. The focus now is on this iron power that's going to last till the end. And you'll begin to see this same thing take place in Daniel 7, same thing emphasized in Daniel 8, same thing emphasized in Daniel 9, same thing emphasized in the latter vision of Daniel, which is 10 through 12. This particular power is the focal point because it is the special, um, it is the special agent of that great serpent called the devil and Satan. Uh, this particular power is that which is going to persecute the people of God in the end of time. And so, friends, as we continue to build on this particular uh, uh, skeleton, of Bible prophecy, beginning with Babylon, going to Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then finally to the Roman church power. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll identify who this is. Many of us know, but we'll, we'll uh, stop speaking in dark sentences in our upcoming presentations. Uh, but this Roman church power, the Bible is identifying as being the, the power that will persecute the people of God again. And we'll see that very clear as we connect all of Bible prophecy. Uh, so with that being said, let me ask, is there any questions over anything that we've studied so far uh, today? Any questions at all? Pretty simple, all right? Amen. So if there's no questions, let's go ahead and kneel for a word of prayer, and we'll close out this afternoon's session. Our Lord and Savior, our Father, our God, we want to thank you for your love and kindness and giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that as we follow the trails that you have left for us in Bible prophecy, that we would be led to wonderful and great light. That, Father, we would see these things as heaven desired to reveal them to us, not merely to point out who the bad guy is, but, Father, to give us an understanding of what took place in the falling away how we can avoid it personally in our own lives, how we can uh, uh, keep the words of your law and do them.
Father, I pray that we would see the, 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 we would understand the underlining plan of salvation in these truths. And Father, one thing we have learned today is that we as your people cannot trust in the state. Instead, Father, we must lean upon your everlasting arms, trusting and knowing, dear Lord, that you will take care of us. Because the moment we start mingling with the power of the state, the church is not benefited. Instead, the church will fall away. So, Father, let us remember these things and let us not do them in, in a small scale, even here in our own churches. Guide us, Father, and keep us and be with us, Lord, as we uh, go our separate ways. In Christ's name we pray.